Hi, and welcome back to the Space Invaders course. We've now made it to lesson seven. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to be having a look at how we can use functions in our code. So we've already used some of those, or some of the ready-made functions inside Tick80, uh, such as the button command to read a button and so on. But we're now going to look and see how we can write our own, how those functions are structured, how we can use them, and then how we can use them to clean up our existing code and make it more readable and maintainable. To see how functions work, we're going to start with a very simple program. So if you've been working through the other lessons, make, make sure you save your work, or if you've just started up, then, then you're ready to go. But we need to now create a, a new program, and that's then created a new one for us. And if we press Escape, you'll see that we're back to our standard um, template that, that Tech 80 provides for you. So I'm just going to press Control A to select everything, and then I'm going to delete that so I have a totally blank block of code. So we're going to start typing in our bit of um, program. So we're going to say our script for this is still going to be our Lua programming code. But what we're going to do is we're going to create two um, variables, A and B. And we're then going to work out, our program is going to work out which is the biggest of those two numbers. So we're going to start off just setting our biggest equal to zero, just so that it's we, we've created the variable. And then we've got our tick function, which finishes there. And inside our tick function, we're first of all just going to clear our screen as normal. And then we're going to do a print statement. And we're going to print out our two numbers. So a equals, and then we use our dot dot stick bits of text together. So a equals, and then the variable a, and then another bit of text. So and b equals and then dot dot b and then we're going to print that in the top right, left hand corner of the screen. We're then going to print out the next bit of code and we're going to print out which is the biggest number which of course we haven't worked out yet and on that one there we're going to type in biggest. Uh, we need to print that underneath the other line, so same exposition, but now 8 pixels down. So we have our starter program, which we're going to start looking at. So we have a system here where we have two variables, so it's two numbers in effect. And what our software is going to do, it's going to print out what those numbers are, and then it's going to print out which is the bigger number. So let's let's run that to begin with and see what it's doing. So if I, uh, one of the shortcuts then for running your program is if you hold the control key in and press R, that will run the program for you. So you can see here that we now have um, our A equals 5, B equals 3, but we haven't yet calculated our biggest number. So let's come back into our code. So we need to, in this area here, calculate our biggest number. And what we can do is we can say, so if a is greater than b, then we can have biggest equals a, else we can then say that biggest equals b, and then we end our if statement. So we now have our bit of code which checks if a is greater than b, then it's a is the bigger number, else or otherwise the biggest number is b. So again, let's try running that. So control R. And we can see here that we now have our biggest number equal to 5. So let's come back out again and back into our code. But what if we now want to compare to other numbers as well? So let's put these in up here and let's create our C equal to, let's say, 6 and D equal to 9. So we want to do exactly the same thing to these numbers, 
So the easiest way here is we could simply copy this code. So let's copy all of this. So I'm going to highlight it, control C, and then down here, I'm going to paste it in with control V. So we have our second block of numbers. So again, we're going to print C equals C and D equals D. And we're going to have to move that down a bit. So remember, these two numbers at the end tell it where on the screen to print. So we printed that at pixel position 8 down. So let's print this at 16. Our comparison block here says where we actually work out which is the bigger number. We want to do C and D. So if C is greater than D, then the biggest number is C. Else the biggest number is D. And print the biggest number equals biggest. And again, we've got to move that down a bit more to 24. So that's just simply copying exactly the same code to do the same function, but on our other two variables, C and D. So if I press Control R, that will run that. And there we can see we have A is 5, B is 3, biggest is 5, C is 6, D is 9, the biggest is 9. So back into our code. But if we have a think about it now, we, we're actually repeating this block of code over and over again. So if, if we have to do the same thing in, an, in lots of different places within our code, we're going to be doing a lot of typing of this set of five lines over and over again. Uh, and again, we're doing a very simple bit of code here. What if, what if we were doing something more complicated, um, like trying to work out if our missile has collided with one of our aliens? Um, that, that's going to take quite a lot of coding to do. And if we're going to have to type it out over and over again, that, that's very, very wasteful of our time. The other thing that's happening here is we have the raw code here. And e e even now, um, it's you, you have to read through that to work out what this block of code actually does. And again, if, if it starts to get more complicated and you see sort of 20 or 30 lines of code in here, again, it, it's very hard to work out what's actually happening. So we really need a way of being able to reuse blocks of code so we can reuse this particular set of instructions. But also, we want to be able to hide that behind a nice name so that it makes it much more easy for us to see what's happening in our program. So let's say if, if we were able to write something along the lines of, so the biggest number equal to get biggest number between A and B, that would make it much easier. So again, we're, th that in effect is almost like an, an English statement. So make the biggest number equal to get biggest number between A and B. And that will make our code much more readable. And as we come back to modify our code at a later date, we, we can see exactly what's happening here and not have to run through all the lines of code in that particular block to work out exactly what it does. So this is where we're going to meet our functions. And actually, this here is how we're going to call our function. What a function lets us do is to take a block of code, which is going to be these sets of lines, and hide them in behind a function name. All we can then do is we can call that function so this, this bit up here where we are calling a function, that lets us execute this block of code. And we can also then pass in a number of what we call parameters, which can be used in our function to actually work out the correct answer. And if, if you remember back to any of the function, built-in functions we've used, like our sprite command or even our print command up here, you can see that we have the function name, which is print, and we then have a set of parameters. So this here block is a string of text, which is our first parameter. So print the text you want to print the X coordinates of where you want it printed and the Y coordinates of where you want it printed. And again, we've used print here and here and here and here. If we had to write that whole print 
block of code out each time we wanted to print a line, you can see how it become very, very awkward. And as I said, the other side then is, we know it says print this, th that makes very good sense. We, un we understand what that's doing. So we've created what's known as our function call here. In other words, we're calling our function, but we haven't yet created the function itself. So if, if we did try and run this, we should get an error. And you can see here that it's telling us that it does not understand what get biggest number actually means. So back into our code. So we now need to make this function. So let's do that right now. So we've seen here that we have our function tick and this is the format we're going to be using. So you can see we have function tick and down at the end, this end statement actually is the end bit of our function. What it's sometimes handy to do is to put a little statement at the back of this and this is the end of our tick function. So we can see where which end matches with which bit of code. So we're now going to make a brand new function and the way we do that is we say oh, function, we then give the function name. So we've called this get biggest number. We then inside brackets, we tell it which parameters we're expecting the calling bit. So the bit where we use the function, what, what parameters is, are we going to be passed? And the name of our parameters are going to be used inside our function and not outside of our function. So we should actually we could actually call this number one and number two and a few lines. And what I tend to do is I tend to then end my function straight away. And this is end get biggest number. So I know where my start and end points are. Now we already know what code we're going to be using in here and we know it is this block of five lines. So let's cut that out of there with my um, control X to cut it and then I'm going to paste it in here with control V and let's just tidy that up a wee bit. So we now have our function. So this is our this is called a function declaration. So de declaration is where we um, state what it is in effect. So let's rework this code to make it fit into our function. So we're, we're going we're to be sending back an answer, which is the biggest number. So let, let's create this variable here. So let's say answer equals, and let's just set it to zero to begin with. I'm, I'm creating a new answer instead of using this biggest number. When we write a function, it's best to have our function self-contained. So for it to use its own variables inside the function. So you've seen here that although, if I scroll up a bit, when we call our function, we're using A and B up here. So this A and B are the variables that exist inside this bit of our code. When the, when the function is called, what we do is we actually pass in the values. So this is known as a pass by value. So A will be replaced by its, its value, which is, is five, and B will be replaced by its value, which is three. So when we get to our actual function itself, what will happen is that our parameter here, so our num1 parameter, will receive the value 5, which was of course our a value, and our, our variable here, or parameter num2, will receive the value 3, which was from our b variable. So these two variables, or parameters, will exist within our function. We've also then now said, OK, we're going to give back an answer and we know that eventually it will go inside the variable biggest. But because we want to keep our function self-contained, we're going to create this new variable called answer sitting down here. And to even make sure that we do that, we're going to put a word in front of it called local. And what that says is this variable answer is local 
or constrained to our function get biggest number. Okay, so answer will only exist inside this function. And really what that means is that if we say for some reason we had used the variable answer somewhere else in our code, if we then use answer here without putting in the variable local, what will happen is that our code can get confused as to which version of answer do you want to use. So if we had a value called answer somewhere up here in our other block of code, when our function gets called, our function is going to overwrite the value in that other version of answer, if that makes sense, by putting a zero on it. Okay, so the general rule that we have is we will create local variables within our function. So if you're not quite sure what's going on, just assume that this is what you do. You create a local variable. We can then give it whatever name we want, and it won't interfere with any other bits of our code. So let's go through this then. So we now have our num1 and our num2. So if num1 is greater than num2, then we're going to make our answer, which again is our local variable, so it doesn't overwrite anything else. That's going to be equal to num1. Else, our answer is going to be equal to num2. So we've now worked out what the answer is. And let's send that back to our other block of code. So th this particular function, it's going to send back a number. So we simply return it and we say return answer. So let's just go over that again then. Okay, there's, there's, there's some, some slightly more complex ideas there. So we've created a function which is going to let us name a block of code. So get biggest number will relate to this block of code, which we know calculates the bigger value out of two numbers coming in. We pass in the two numbers using these parameters. And these two parameters will in effect become this idea of local variables that they will only exist inside our function. So we then, if we need to use variables inside our function, we're going to call them local variables. And that will mean that they don't interfere with any other bits of code that we have outside. And really that means we don't have to worry about what we call our, our variable. Because even if we do use the same name that we've used somewhere else, it's not gonna cause us any problems. So we can do our code using all of our local variables and local parameters. And then if our function gives back an answer, we can return that value using the return command. So now we've got our function working, or at least all the code written. Let's have a look back up at the place where we use it. So we go back up to our uh, print statements. So you can see here that we've got our printing out our a and B values, and then we do what's known as our function call. So that's where we typed in our, our function. So we say here, we've got a variable called biggest, which we want to end up with the bigger value of A and B in this number. So we are calling, so this is called a function call. We are calling our get biggest number function. We're passing it our A and B values. And if you remember, when we look back here, we had this bit where it says return the answer. So when our function finishes, it will in effect take the value of that returned value. So biggest number will be equal to the returned answer. And that's the way we read that. So we're going to do the same thing down here. <clears throat> so again, we can say the biggest number this time will be get biggest number, but this time we're going to be doing it between C and D. And then again, we're going to print that out. So 
we clear screen, we print up what MB are, we then get work out what the biggest value between MB is, we then print that out, and we then do the same for C and D. So let's have a look and see if that works. So escaping out and running. And we should now find that everything works as before. So we have our a equals 5, b equals 3, biggest is 5, and then 6 and 9, and the biggest being 9. But we're now doing this using our function code. And we are now being able to reuse that function to really calculate the difference between any two numbers that we happen to put in there. So that's the theory of functions. So just to recap then, we're using our function to, in effect, name a block of code. So this block of code here is the bit that actually calculates this biggest number. But we've given it a name and this function call. We're allowed to pass in a number of values, a number of parameters. And that then makes our code up here both shorter in that we don't have to type out the full block of code in here, but also easier to read, because we can now say that biggest, we know that it is simply getting the biggest number between these two values. So we're now going to take this function idea. Um, we're going to go back to our main Space Invaders program and try and use functions to refactor some of our code to make it a bit more readable. But before we do that, I'm just going to save this um, little exercise just so we have a, a copy of it in our, in our records. So I'm going to save, I'm just going to call it functions. Uh, I, I've already been playing with this, obviously, so I'm just going to save it over the top of my last version. If I then list out our current work, we can see that lesson six was the last one we were working on. So I'm going to load in our lesson six code. And if you remember, if we run that, we got as far as moving left and right and firing our missile with it coming out of our actual um, gun, gun port. Yeah. So let's go back into our code and we'll see where we got to. So again, as usual, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to um, modify our code, which I obviously forgot to do last time. So we're now working on lesson number seven. Uh, and let's just save that. So let's just come out of here and let's just save lesson seven, because we're now working on that. And back in again. So if we look down here, you can see that we have our um, variables. So remember we did a bit of refactoring before where we used our objects and that let us make our variables much more um, well structured. We then come into our main tick function and this is where we have our growing block of code. So you can see here we have a number of things going on and it keeps going on until we get to the end of our function. So we've only got this single tick function at the moment. So let's make this a bit more readable. So if we work through what's happening then, we know that we have our first line here, which is our CLS function, which clears the screen. And we use that again, remember, to just get everything off there so we can start drawing on a fresh palette. We then have our left and right button detection. So this is where we're now checking if the player ship is moving. We update the player values, and then we have some limit checking where we're checking to see if it's gone off the left or the right hand edge of the screen. So we can obviously take this block of code and make that a bit more easy to understand. Because what if our function tick now said, when we come into the function, we clear the screen and then we simply move our player ship. So we're going to create a function call here. This function, however, is not going to return any values. It's simply going to execute some code. So in the last exercise we're doing there, we saw that we can send information back, but we don't need to bother with doing that. So we can just simply call the function by itself. We're not going to pass any parameters into this because we're going to see in a second that we can actually force our function to use our main variables. 
So again, our, our player ship and player bullet. And if you think about it, in effect, th this function tick is doing exactly that. It's using our, what we call global variables because they're available anywhere uh, and working with those. <clears throat> so this is gonna be our, our new function, move player ship. So let's go and create that down here a bit. So after this is the end, and what it's handy to do here, say, is to um, put a little note to ourselves that this end relates to the tick function itself, so we know where we are in our code. And we're now going to create our new function, which was the move player ship function. And again, it doesn't accept any parameters and it will eventually end, okay? And again, make a note to ourselves, this is move player ship. So this is where our code for moving the player ship is going to go. So let's go back up and see where that is. And we simply can grab hold of this. I'm going to use Control X to cut it out of there, and then use Control V to drop it in here. So let's have a look, and let's just tie it up. Let's just tab that in so it lines up with the rest of our code in here. So we now have our move player ship function. And again, it does exactly the same as it did up in the other place. And again, it's using these variables. So we haven't declared any local variables for this. So when it says player ship, what it will do, it first of all looks to see if you've created a local version of player ship, which we haven't. And it will then look, in effect, back up the tree. So we'll have a look if there was a player, um, a player ship variable in the calling area. And again, we know that that then relates back out to our main player ship variable, which is this one here. Okay. And what we're talking about now is something called the scope of a variable. So we've seen that our functions, we can have, we can create local variables. So remember, we were coming in here and we were saying a local variable. When we talk about scope then, scope is where we can actually see this variable. So if we create a local variable inside our function, this variable is said to have function scope. In other words, it's only visible within this function. When, if we were to go up here, that variable is not visible. It doesn't have scope in this tick function. And it also doesn't have scope out here where we're initializing our variables. But what we're now using, just, just to make this clear to you, is our player ship variable. Because we've declared it right out here in the main initialization area, everything in effect comes in after this block of code or an effect inside this block of code. So we have our player ship variable, and this is why it's called a global variable. We've declared it out here, so it's not inside any function, so therefore it will not have any local function scope. It will now be a global variable. And that means that we can use it anywhere we want inside our code. And that's quite an easy way of, of getting around this problem of moving data around, is if we declare global variables, um, we, we can then access them anywhere we want. Um, now, anybody who's been looking into programming might hear about not using global variables, but when we're looking at Lua, this becomes a very easy way for us to get around the problem of moving data around. And because this is our first program, um, this is what, the way we're going to do it. So, just be aware then, we have our player ship. Because we declared it outside of any other function, it becomes global and we can use it anywhere we want. So coming back down then, we've now got our function tick, clears the screen, and then it moves the player ship. So that bit of refactoring then simply took a block of code and replaced it with this function call. So we should have exactly what we had before. So if we come out and we run, we still have our ship moving left and right and firing as before. So that's the first bit of refactoring we've done. 
The next bit then is we've got in here where we're checking if the fire button is being pressed. And if the fire button is being pressed, we're then activating the bullet and then moving the bullet. So why don't we um, put that in here? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a function called check player fire. Again, it's not going to accept any parameters and it's going to be this block of code here. So all the way down to here. We're going to cut that out and we're going to do check player fire. So underneath our the function. So function check player fire. It has no parameters. And here we're doing our end and it's our check player fire function. And that's where we're going to paste in our code. And again, we're just going to tab that in and just tidy it up slightly. So again, it's doing exactly the same code as it did in the previous position. Um, but we're now getting our, fun our tick function. And you can see now that we're gradually making this a bit more readable. So we know that function tick, we know that that's just the general loop, but we know that it comes in, it clears the screen, it then handles the player ship movement, it then handles the player firing mechanism, and then it comes off and it's now going to go on to some other stuff here, which is actually drawing things in place. So let's have a look at what it does then. So it's then going to draw our player bullet. Okay, so let's create that function. So draw player bullet. And we're going to, that doesn't take any, any parameters. So let's cut that block out. And we have our draw player bullet function down here. So function draw player bullet and our end, and that is the end of our draw player bullet function. We paste our code in there. And we go back up here. And this last bit then is drawing our player ship. So we're going to draw our player ship function. And that's going to be this block of code here. And let's put that down the end here. So we have our function draw player ship, which doesn't take any parameters. And we end our function draw player ship. And we paste our code in there. So back up to our tick function. So you can see now that our tick function is actually becoming quite understandable and quite readable. So as it comes through here, we clear the screen, we move our player ship, we check if the, if the fire button's being pressed, we then draw any bullets that we need to, and we then draw our player ship. And that's our main game loop. If we then want to look at what's involved with moving the player ship, we simply look down at our function, and we can see there that we have a nice understandable block of code. We know that we know what this block of code does because we've given it a sensible name and we can see here it's checking two buttons and then checking some limits. So let's have a look and see if that actually still works. So come out here and run and we should have exactly the same as we had before. And, and that's now working fine but now using our function code. So back in again. So the refactoring we've done so far has really made our code more readable. We haven't actually changed any of the code as such. We've just taken some of the existing blocks and put them inside these functions so that our main tick function now, if we look through here, is, is much more readable. But let's have a look at some of the code that we now still have. And we're going to look at our move player ship function. So you can see here, we actually have our, our two button checks and they actually then update our player ship um, position X variable. In other words, the left and right position of our player ship. And we then do a block of checking to see if it's gone off either edge. 
Well, what we're really doing here is we're doing what's known as edge detection. Um, we're limiting our value to a, 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 set, a maximum and a minimum. Now, we've seen already when we did our bouncing around the screen program that this limit checking is something we're going to maybe have to do quite often. So why don't we again do this idea of refactoring it and we're going to extract this code as another function. So let's create a function called check limits. So we're going to create a new function and it's going to be called check limits. What this function is going to do is going to receive a number and then a maximum and minimum value. And it will simply then return back that number, but inside its limits. So let's uh, write that out then. So we're going to get a value. We're then going to have the minimum value, the maximum value. And once we've done our function um, declaration, let's just do the, put the end in so we don't forget to do it. So check limits. And our function then is really going to just do exactly the same code as we do up here. So let's start adding in our if statements then. So let's uh, come down here. So we say if the value we're checking is uh, greater than our maximum value, then we're going to set our value equal to that maximum value. Now before we had used separate if statements for each block, but what we can actually do is our if statement is able to chain itself together. So we can actually chain a second if statement on here. And what we can say is else if value is less than min, then value equal to minimum. And what this is saying then is we do our first check. So we check if it's gone off the um, right hand edge of the screen. And if it has, we limit its value to that right hand edge. If it hasn't gone off the right hand edge of the screen, then we do a second check to see if it's gone off the left hand edge of the screen. And if it has, we limit its value to that. We could then say, so if it hasn't gone off the right and it hasn't gone off the left, we're then left in our else block. <clears throat> so this is this is our sort of um, our, our, our last chance in effect. And if, if it, so it hasn't gone off either edge, then we can simply say that value, if I can type, value, just keep it equal to itself. And that would be the end of our if statement. So we have, going off one side, if that's not true, then we try a second test. If that's not true, then basically our next one is saying else. So if nothing has, if none of the previous if parts have, have, have proved true, then we end up going into our else clause, which is this bit here. And we know our function then, it's going to need to send back this value and we're going to return it. Okay, so we're sending the number and it's maximum and minimum. And then we get back a number which is either being clipped at the maximum value or clipped at the minimum value or kept the same. So this is the block of code here where we need to do that check limits. So we're going to say that our player ship dot position dot x. So that's the value that we want to check the limits for. We're going to set it equal to this check limits function. And we're then going to pass in our various parameters into this check limits function. So our first parameter 
is the, the value that we want to check the limits for. The second parameter, and let me just go to our um, smaller font size, is the uh, minimum value that that, val that that parameter can take. So I'm, again, I'm just copying and pasting in here. And the third one is our maximum value and then we close our brackets for our function. And we can now get rid of these if statements because that's being handled now by our function call. So our move player ship function, it now checks the two buttons and updates the player position. And then we use, we set our player position equal to this check limits function, which is going to take in our current player position and the maximum and minimum values that it can have. And it will then return back the value for our new player position, which is clipped at the top and the bottom. Okay, and again, this is the code that does that, does that clipping. So let's see if that all works okay. And we'll run that. So we, as we go across to our left-hand side, again, it's clipping at that function, at that value there, and over to the side, and it's clipping there. And all of our firing all still works. So that's given us our, our refactored code. Now down to using our function. Again, you can see how, how moving blocks out into these functions makes things a bit easier to see what's going on. So we've got our tick function is now very readable. Our move player ship function. And again, we can make that more readable by adding in some, some calls. So that one there is checking our um, move right button. And this one is check move left button. And then with this line here, we can see that it's simply doing a check limits on our player position X, player ship position X. So again, we're, we're gradually making our code more readable. As you can see, our, our individual blocks of code are becoming smaller and more understandable. And all of this is going to lead to us being able to program more efficiently. If, if, if we have massive big blocks of code that do lots of very complicated things, it can become very hard to actually make them work. Uh, our debugging and so on becomes, becomes awkward because we simply don't know where in our code we need to, we need to look. But by doing this, we know that if our, our ship isn't moving correctly, it's going to be happening somewhere inside this move player ship block of code, which we very neatly sectioned off inside this function. So we know that our bug will be in here somewhere or possibly in one of the functions that it calls. So if it's not, if it's not stopping at the end of the screen, we know that our, our check limits function is probably where we have to look. And again, we're down to looking at only um, seven or eight lines of code here. So that's what we're using functions for in this. But let's have a then look a look, little look at where we currently are in our, in our game. So if we come back out again and run, well, see, the last problem we have at the moment is um, when we fire our button, if we press the fire button a second time, we get it doing this sort of clipped firing action where our bullet doesn't actually go up to the top of the screen. We can reset that bullet. So we have a bug in our firing system. And we're going to see in our next lesson where we're we actually going to fix this bug, how using have, having created our functions, it will make it much easier to track down our bug and to see where exactly it's going wrong because we're now dealing with nice short blocks of code. So make sure that we save our work. Again, we've already called it lesson seven, so I'm just saving mine as lesson seven. And we'll fix our firing bug in the very next lesson. So I'll see you there. Bye.
Don't forget to visit the course pages for this project. There you'll be able to download the code for this lesson and get lots of extra hints and tips. You'll also get access to all my other programming, electronics and gaming projects. All the links are in the description below. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.